will continue. Who's read this book? <laughs> Anybody? Not yet? Okay. What's wrong with that book? Could you get your CFO to buy it and give it to the whole company as a Christmas present? Not really, eh? Why not? Because it doesn't really sound that positive. Is there value in delivering the wrong product four times as fast? Y who said yes? Why? Exactly, you'll learn. And you get four shots for the same price, right? Maybe you're lucky and one of them, one of them it reminds us of IT projects, doesn't it? Exactly. So obviously that's not the real title. The real title is The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time. Anybody read that book? Yes? <laughs> Thanks. Can we keep it to relevant questions from now on? <laughs> it is uh, more or less the same talk as I gave for Cotopia, Cotopia in uh, Chicago. Yes, uh, it was a keynote. Uh, there's a little twist at the end, though. Uh, that was a question. Yeah. So, this back to the actual talk. Thanks for interrupting. Um, the art of doing twice the work in half the time. Could you get your CFO to buy that book for your company as a Christmas present? My guess is yes. Why? Because the title pretty much says the same as the one before. The art of delivering the wrong product four times as fast. In my view, anyway. So, apologies to everybody who came here to hear some agile bashing. I'm a big proponent and fan of agility. That's what I work as an agile coach. Um, so that's not what this is going to be. It's also not going to be some scrum bashing, because I actually quite like that framework, uh, that simple framework. Um, it is criticism about the title, though. Not from a marketing point of view, as I said, like people buy it. And many pi people buy it for that reason, because it says the art of doing twice the work in half the time, so being more efficient. And agility is also about efficiency in many ways. We, like, we limit uh, dependencies and therefore are handovers. Um, we, we want autonomous team, teams that uh, can make quicker decisions. They don't have to ask their boss for, for decisions. Uh, we want to limit bureaucracy and all that. That's all about efficiency and getting more efficient. Um, but it is more about effectiveness, and that's what this talk is about. This talk is about also like being able to see like there's lots of conflicts in organizations that I see between people and the organization, and people that are not super happy. And in my view, it is often because people like with an agile mindset, as we like to say, or like they prefer agile ways of working, but they are in an organization that is focused on efficiency. And that creates, creates friction. So danger ahead that way. A little bit about myself. My name is Klaus Bukalassen. Funny last name, it's Danish. And uh, I have a wife and twins, age 14. Good luck, Klaus. I am originally was born and raised in Denmark. Um, I've lived in Australia and Canada for a short while. Um, but for the past 25 years, I've mostly lived in Switzerland. That's where I'm based at now as well. I uh, work with companies and organizations. I socialize with them like these. One Scrum Inc. as you see, so the company from Jeff Sutherland, the Swiss Agile Leader Circle, and Trifork, and a few others. These are customers that I have or am working with and helping them becoming more agile. This is what I do. So, as I said, I'm an agile trainer, coach, consultant, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I've done lots of co trainings with Jeff. The reason I mention that here is not to brag anything, but it's because it's important to understand that. I like his book, and I like working with Jeff. I consider him a friend. I just don't like the title of that book, okay? Because it, it talks to the wrong thing, in my view. So back to the talk, agility is inefficient. The goal of this talk is to provoke a discussion, a conscious discussion about efficiency and effectiveness and what comes first, and to help you detect what I like to call fake agility. So if organizations want to become agile, but really to become more efficient and not more effective. And we'll talk a lot about like what is the difference between efficiency and effectiveness. 
Then I'll show you a couple of examples of organizations that did exactly that, focused purely on efficiency or mostly on efficiency and what that led to. And um, then at the end I'll show you four warning signs of like, if you see that in your organization, that is a sign of your organization is focusing more on efficiency. So let's get to discuss first what is effectiveness and efficiency. Anybody care to define that? Exactly. So outcome versus output. Effectiveness would be about outcome. And efficiency, hard to steer this one, is about output. There's a different way you can say it. Like often you'll hear this. So effectiveness is about doing the right things. And efficiency is about doing things right. In the doing things right, we could also put quality in there, but I'm not talking about quality today, just about speed. Okay? So a different way of looking at it is efficiency is about looking inwards, into your organization, into your team. It's about improving processes, it's about getting better, optimizing things. Okay? You don't need to talk to the market or customers or look outwards at all. It's only about like how can we get better and faster at producing things, whatever those things are. If we think of a, a tire factory, a factory that's producing tires, and they go from 10,000 tires a day to 12,000 tires a day, without using more input, other than maybe some extra rubber and electricity, but they don't need bigger uh, construction halls, etc. They don't need more people. Then they've increased output without increasing input, and therefore increase their efficiency in this example by 20%. Okay? Effectiveness is the opposite pretty much. It's looking outwards. It's like looking at the market, looking at the customers. How do they play with our product? How do they work with our product? What are they willing to pay? In the example of the tire factory, it's like a factory can, one factory can produce 10,000 tires, but nobody wants to buy them unless they sell them at a huge discount. Basically hand them out for free. And another tire factory is producing three tires a day, and people are standing in line and almost willing to pay any price to buy these tires because they're really, really good. Okay, or uh, fulfill some purpose that, that, that uh, people are asking for. It doesn't have to be only quality, of course. Now, is a tire factory that's producing three tires a day, is that going to be successful? <coughs> Probably not unless they can sell them really expensive, those tires. Okay, is a tire, uh, tire factory that's producing 12,000 tires a day that, that they can't sell going to be successful? Hmm. Probably not. We probably need the combination of both. And we're going to look more into that. Before that, does this remind you of Scrum? This is actually the two roles, Scrum Master and Product Owner, that we have in Scrum. One is looking out, one is looking in. Maybe exaggerated slightly, but the Scrum Master is basically looking in, helping the team to produce more. The product owner is basically looking, ma mainly looking out and explaining inward uh, to, to the team uh, what the customers want and where we, where we headed. Okay? Good. So, the efficiency is the how, and the effectiveness is the what. Now, I could define success as being the product of efficiency time effectiveness. Again, it's not a plus, it's not either or. You probably want both. Right? You want to produce the right tires and you want to be able to produce enough of them so you can make a profit of it. Okay, Goldratt uh, from The Goal. Anybody read The Goal? Probably the most fantastic book ever written, in my view anyway. Like he, uh, he, he defines productivity exactly like that. So, as agilists, we know we don't want to do everything in parallel. We want to do one thing first, and then the other thing. So what is it we want to do first? Focus on efficiency or effectiveness? So say we here, we have this uh, effectiveness times efficiency matrix, and we are down in the lower left corner. We have low efficiency, low effectiveness in our organization. We will die. Right? We don't produce the right products, and we produce them too expensive. So we can't even give a discount. So the question is now, are we going towards more efficiency or more effectiveness first? Okay. And um, our good friend here, he already uh, had, a, had, a, had a quote on that. 
There's nothing quite so useless, it's Peter Drucker, useless as doing gr uh, with great efficiency things that shouldn't have been done at all. Okay, so he kind of tells us like, don't do that. This one, because it'll mean you'll die slowly. Maybe you'll die suddenly, like Nokia did for instance. Uh, maybe you'll die faster, but you'll probably die if you just produce the same things that people don't want anymore. They probably wanted them at some time, but they don't want them anymore because there's, uh, there's a different product now that's better. If you just like continuously work on more efficiency and getting better and faster and cheaper at it, then you'll just die slower, maybe faster. Don't really care. You'll still die. Okay, so maybe rather move over to the le uh, uh, yellow area and survive. So figure first out which product to buy. And if you succeed in that, then move up to the flourish here, um, where you have both high efficiency and effectiveness. Beware of compla becoming complacent in that area. You'll s have lots of organizations, and we'll s uh, as I promised, we'll see a few examples of organizations that at one point in time had the right product, were quite efficient, and just continued focusing on like how can we get even cheaper and better at producing this product and continuing to, to sell that product. Okay? Because then you'll all of a sudden end up in this die slowly uh, area again, or die suddenly even. Yes. So another few quotes that I quite like. One is um, Stephen R. Covey, anybody knows what book he wrote? Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, exactly. So, effective people, not efficient people. And he said, like, if the ladder is not leaning against the right wall, every step we take just gets us to the wrong place faster. Being Danish and liking sarcasm, I quite like this one as well from Yogi Berra. We lost, but we're making good time. Right, so one last slide before we move on to the examples. So we have here Mr. Efficiency. That's this guy here. What is he shouting? Exactly, very good. Faster. What is Mr. Effectiveness over in the other corner here shouting? Row. <laughs> Plug the hole, okay? So does that mean we always doing effectiveness first? In this case, maybe it is does make sense to first like survive a little bit longer and then make sure we die slowly, right? If at all, and then so like shovel a bit of water out first before we look for the hole because it, if it takes them ten minutes to plug the hole, the boat is probably sunk by then, right? So I'm not saying it's black and white and you can just follow, even though people love recipes and just like follow like this, it's not. But it's good to understand the difference. And in many cases, it is very dangerous to, to just look at efficiency. Uh, yeah. So let's look at a few examples. This one, anybody recognizes that store? So it seems to be closed. Question, is that the only one? No, look at that. There's another one. Ah, but that's, it says this location only, right? So that must be the only one, though. So Blockbuster, as it was mentioned over here, yes. So that seems to be the only one. Or is it? Oh, look at that. Just a quick search on the internet, you'll find a couple of more pictures of, like, store closing, store closing, store closing everywhere. So uh, another seven there. So we've got nine already. Well, as a matter of fact, by 2010, another 9,085 branches had closed. Because block that's the year Blockbuster went bankrupt. Now, why did Blockbuster go bankrupt? <laughs> From this talk, you might have guessed why. Although it sounds crazy, like before the efficiency, because it was super efficient. But that's exactly what uh, Forbes magazine, they did a, a, a study on this. And uh, that's exactly what they say. Blockbuster failed because they were efficient. Because they were a highly oiled machine, a tight network that could execute with extreme efficiency. But what they didn't do is listen, like look outwards. Like I said before, efficiency is looking inwards, right? That's what they did. And they were really good at it. Okay, but they didn't look out. Here are a few quotes from Blockbuster. 
that clearly show that they didn't really look out. So uh, K uh, Jim Keyes in 2008, so two years before they were in back, said like, mic problems, but still working. Hmm. Is it still? Okay, okay. So Jim Keyes, uh, the CEO, he, he said in 2008, neither the red box, admittedly I don't even know what red box is, but uh, nor Netflix is even on our radar. And DVDs, yes, it's a melting glacier, but it's a slow melt. Raise your hand if you've watched a DVD this year. Okay, three. Within the last five years, four. Within the last five years, okay, a few. But that's, like, in my world, that's a quick melting. I have 600 DVDs in my basement, and I have no idea what to do with them. And I haven't watched a DVD for probably 10 years now. Well, maybe six years, seven years. So I think that's a quick melting glacier, even quicker than the glaciers in Switzerland, the real glaciers. The, the head of digital strategy in 2010, mind you what year that was, the year they went bankrupt, said like never, if we are strategically better positioned than almost anybody else out there. Never would I have aimed this high. Okay? In 2000, actually, Reed Hastings, the founder and CEO of Netflix went to Dallas to Blockbuster headquarters and said like, hmm, because Netflix was like on the, on the brink of, of, uh, of uh, going bankrupt, he needed money. He went to Blockbuster and said like, we should do something together. You guys can buy us for $50 million. They laughed him out of the office. Now, that would have been a good investment. It would actually have 6,000 folded, can you say that in English? Your investment. Because this is the share price, admittedly I just checked it before this, so today is actually a little bit lower. This is like a week ago, it was 683. So that's a market capitalization of $302 billion. The highest that Blockbuster ever was, was five billion dollars in 2004 when they had the height of the operation. So this is 60 times higher than the highest market capitalization that Blockbuster had with 85,000 employees and 9,094 stores. They probably should have said, let's buy Netflix. Would Netflix then have been as successful as it is today? Exactly, I don't think so either. I think Blockbuster would have killed the video star. <laughs> Pretty sure they would have like, become a super efficient Netflix, but not one that produces what people want. Another example, and I'm sure there's a couple of employees here, former employees. Was that the 3310, I think? Who's had this phone? Yeah, a few of us. So in Forbes again, in 2007, they wrote, can anyone catch the cell phone king? So could anyone catch the cell phone king in 2007? What else happened in 2007? The first iPhone came out, right? Hmm, I wonder what happened. I, I researched a little bit here. There's a study from INSEAD uh, who looked at this, but what was more interesting uh, to me anyway was looking at some comments from former employees of Nokia. And they say the sa same thing. Like Nokia was a very large ship that took forever to change direction. Or down here, the, yellow, the lower part, Nokia was a really efficient machine, but efficient at producing the wrong things. Not what people wanted. People wanted Symbian phones until 2007. But once the iPhone came out, they didn't. And that, even though the iPhone was a ridiculous bad phone, like on paper, it had 2G, it didn't have any GPS, you couldn't install any apps, like you could on, on Symbian phones, it had a two megapixel crappy camera without a flash, like people were laughing their pants off of that phone, right? Um, here's an example of that, for instance. Anybody seen that video before? Well, you'll see it now.
He likes their strategy. He likes it a lot. Hey, eh? I was a little bit too fast here. So Steve is saying he knows the market. He knows what the market wants, like machines with keyboards, like email machines. It does internet. Fantastic. Um, so he th says he knows what the market wants, and they can deliver it at $99 instead of $500 fully subsidized. That's what he's saying. He's arguing efficiency. We are better at delivering the right product, right? Of course, that's wrong. It's, it's, uh, we all know what happened. Like, anybody has a micro, I don't, I, you can't even have a, a Windows phone anymore, right? I don't think that exists. Um, so we all know what happened afterwards. So history has it about to repeating itself. This is exactly 10 years later. It's missing. <laughs> At what point did he talk about the product being better? He didn't. He doesn't talk like we build better cars. He just says we make more money. Like we are super efficient. Now, what does the share market tell us? So this is when he had the talk that we just saw the video of, October 2017. Okay, that's Volkswagen's share price and like relative like I had the, the zero point for before, before and Tesla and what happened to Volkswagen well they have a plus of 85 percent respectively over that that's a good investment over four years to have an 85 percent increase on your investment okay you could also have put your money into Tesla what would have happened you would have had a plus of 1735 percent measured last week Okay, I didn't check the share price today. Okay, so maybe it is about building the best product first and not being super efficient. That's exactly what Tesla did, right? They didn't build like a super cheap car that they could sell, an electric car. I think we saw that in the, was in the keynote today, um, the, the ugly car. Um, uh, but, but they built the right product first, right? That's what they focused on first, and then making it cheap with the Model 3 and the Model Y, etc. So today, Tesla is eight times more worth than Volkswagen. And mind you, Volkswagen is the second biggest uh, car manufacturer in the world, or the third biggest. Or Tesla is as worth as much as these five. Actually, that's old information. That's three months ago. Now they are plus 10 more. So the next 15 automakers, if you take their market capitalization and add it together, that's what Tesla is worth today. I think it's crazy. It's ludicrous that Tesla is worth so much. Don't get me started on that. But the market apparently thinks like Tesla has, has the, the right strategy, as Steve called it, right? So let me get into the four warning signs. One, number one, is if you have like strong budgets or focus on budgets and cost cutting. Okay, if you're working in an organization where you have like continuously cost cutting instead of continuously funding, then that is a sign that you are working in an organization where there's focus on spending cuts and focus on cost rather than value. And that is an indication that there's a lot of focus or there's a culture of focusing on efficiency rather than effectiveness. Okay, so if you see a lot of this, and if you try to, to talk to it and there's no appetite in the organization to like change anything around it, that's an indication of like, uh, if, if you have an agile mindset and you want to like work in a more agile way of working, then uh, that's a sign that you're probably headed for a little bit of trouble there. Number two is your, if your company is run by process people. And what I mean by process people is again people looking inwards. Okay, so people focused on processes People like economics in many ways are, are, are that type of people. Like this is, for instance, a, a, an, an ad, and you don't need to read it, um, for, for a bank in Zurich, where they're adding, they're looking for the head of process excellence program. And it's about like process design and optimization, optimization measures, control transformation, and success centrally. It's often like centralization. If you feel there's a lot of centralization happening, that's also often f a, a sign that they're focusing on efficiency, um, et cetera, et cetera. Right? If you feel that your organization is run by process people and not product people, then that's also a sign that the company as a whole focuses more on efficiency than they do on product, on, on um, 
effectiveness. Number three is a high degree of specialization. And you all probably know you're working like where you have a high degree of specialization. The question is more like, is there an appetite to go away from that? And I don't mean to complete generalization in the sense of like everybody can do everything. That's a common misconception about agility or scrum teams that everybody has to be able to do everything. That's not what it is about. We're talking about these T-shapedness. Uh, do you guys know what I mean by T-shapedness? So instead of like being super specialized and investing in getting more specialized, you actually invest more time in like being able to do other work as well than your super specialty. And of course, if you have high degree of specialization, if, if I'm the specialist in uh, like optimiz uh, optimizing some particular version of Oracle database, then I will be able to do work in that area better and faster than anybody else. So for me individually, that is high efficiency. Right? But because I can't do any work alone anymore, I'm dependent on seven other people or other specialists, there will be lots of handovers and that actually makes them really slow. So it's not even super, super uh, efficient that way. And it certainly takes away the focus from being effective using the right product. And then the last one, which is my favorite, therefore last, like dessert, um, utilization maximization. So I had this project manager, I, I, I vividly remember where I was sitting, a uh, software developer and, and like team lead, it was called back then, and she came by and said, like, Klaus, do you all have enough to do? And I think all developers have this reflex, if they get asked that question, they just nod, because what happens if we shake our head? Exactly, we just get more work, right? So that's about ma utilization, maximization, like, like loading people so like their personal backlog is like super full so you never run out of work. And I thought to myself, like, I, I went home that, that, uh, that day and even in the shower and the next morning, I was still thinking about this sentence because it really felt wrong. And I have concluded that it ha this question, do you guys have enough to do, has made it into the top three of the dumbest questions I've ever been asked. Because there are dumb questions, and this is one of them. Because it's completely relevant whether we have enough to do. What is relevant is whether we produce the right stuff and then enough of it. Okay, and that's what should be asked. It's like, can I help you to produce more stuff or can I help you to produce the, uh, the right stuff? So utilization maximization is not even being inefficient. It is like a freeway. If you have a freeway where like traffic is going slow already, so you're not really happy with the throughput because there are lots of cars on the freeway, who thinks it's a good strategy to go like, ah, let's like throughput is not enough. Let's put more cars on the freeway. Like to go from a utilization from 70 to 80 or 90 percent. That's a stupid idea. And it's the same with teams, because there's handovers, Let's ju just like with traffic, like one uh, guy hits the brake, that has an effect on every everybody else behind them. Right? So if you're working towards maximum uh, utilization, maximization, that's a bad idea. So those were the four warning signs of smells. I think in, in, in software development we often use, often use the term smells, which I quite like. Um, if you see those, then at least today you've learned why you might be in conflict with your managers or with your organization. Because if they focus on this kind of stuff and you have more like an agile mindset, then um, that creates friction, yeah. So what the book title really should have been is the art of delivering twice the value at half the cost. I got that changed in the Scrum Scale Guide at least because originally it also said like the art of delivering twice the work at half the time. So I changed that and that was accepted. So at least we got to that. And uh, yeah. So you're telling us about all these smells and so on, but, but what should we do with it? Should we just run or what? I think that's a pretty good strategy. Jeff said once in a, in, in a, in a training, he said like if everybody left the bad companies, we wouldn't have bad companies anymore. Come on, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous? Yeah, you stopped here also in Chicago, and I, I mean, I just don't buy that. So, really? So, um, let me show you something I prepared. I knew you would stop here. So, uh, let me just try and hack your system here. Take, you, take your fingers off my machine. Hey, can I get the clicker? Come on. Okay. Okay. So, 
So Klaus, you pr you basically propose that we run. I don't think we can hear you. Oh. Yeah. yeah. You need to Done. shove it in your mouth. Okay. But I'm an agile coach too. I'm not running away. I want to fight. Maybe not like, uh, what is it called? The Netflix, no, the HBO series. Uh, I don't have HBO. Or whatever. <laughs> but I want to fight. I want to change this. We see this every day in our companies. Maybe Blockbuster didn't have a chance to actually have some agile coaches to, to make them see how wrong they were. But I want to fight. I want to change the companies that I'm in to understand how the value of Agile, actually the Agile mind mindset can, can bring value. Or at least while I'm there and maybe I'm hit by certain things of these smells, I want to be able to contain them so they don't interfere with the Agile uh, world that we already created. Because often these things can create noise that makes it even harder to introduce the Agile mindset. So if we don't run, there are these two strategies. We can either contain them and, and see if we can keep them at bay so they don't interfere, or we can try to hack them. We can try to infiltrate. We can try to change the system to the better way. In either case, we really need to understand what is it that lies behind these four smells? What is it, what are the goals for the company, for the management, for the people that are proposing these valuable directions as they see it? And what is the perspective of the counterpart? And just to give a couple of examples, uh, let's look into two of them. For instance, we have budgets and cost cut. So example one, how can we hack a budget? A budget talk or budgets? Well, if we look at why do we have budgets? Budgets are a management tool for governance and control, for keeping costs at bay. So the goal is obviously that we don't um, run over our budgets. But budgets are even more nowadays. You have all kinds of budgets. And the perspective from management is we want continuously to have status reports to make sure that we are within the boundaries. One way of, uh, if I go from my own experience, I've actually tried to replace these reporting uh, structures. And my experience is that that doesn't work because we're moving away from something that our managers know and we're given something they don't really understand. So in another tactic would be to piggyback on that, to add measurements that are agile, but keep the ones that, that uh, are more of a classical uh, reporting structure. And then exploit the status meetings by talking about more and more about the agile measurements, the outcomes, the impacts, customer satisfaction, value, the effectiveness, not the efficiency. That's one way of hacking. And as we know, and Klaus also said earlier, we need to take small steps if we want to change the mindset. And this is just a small step, but we are in a system. And small steps can have big uh, results. Another example is uh, the specialist. So uh, a containment tactic a strategy in a situation where you have an agile team that has a dependency to a specialist. But why do we actually have specialists? Well, we have specialists because they are very good at uh, executing tasks that are very specialized. And if we have tasks in our company that need special attention and special competencies, obviously we want, we want specialists. And what's the goal? Well, for the company, it's to make sure that we have people that can do all the tasks that we need. And hence, we also have a a uh, tendency to hire a lot of specialists. What is the perspective from, the, from, from management around specialists? Well, it's that they want the effectiveness of a specialist. But if we are in an agile team and we have a dependency to a specialist, that can hinder our flow. I have an example. I was in a team where um, 
we had a print function, and the print function was a special system. There was one person who, could able, uh, who was able to actually help us. So each time we had a print uh, task, we had to wait for the person to be available, sometimes weeks. We had a dialogue with the uh, management about how could we ease this uh, bottleneck, but there was no interest in actually moving in the direction of T-shapedness or hiring a new, uh, an additional person. So what we did was actually, the next time we had a print uh, task, we shadowed, one, one of our guys shadowed him, was sitting next to him while he did the job. We did the same thing the second time. The third time, our guy could do 50% of what the specialist did. And in that way, we actually created a relationship to the person, which helped us, and we became more independent. And this is a containment strategy because we're in essence not changing the specialism, the specialist's uh, role or person. But we are doing some, you could say, rebel. we use our rebel talent to actually um, create an adapter that allows us to become, become more independent. And uh, the last example I have is uh, utilization. Klaus's favorites. Um, so what is it about utilization that's so difficult? Because in one hand, if you think about lean agile theory, sometimes it's even good not to do anything. Because if the bottleneck is further down the road, everything you do just gets laying around. We can't use it. It doesn't provide value. But think about it from a personal or individual perspective. The individual, I mean, how would you have it if you would be sitting there and getting to taught that, uh, or told that you weren't supposed to do anything? Everybody wants to contribute. So I think it's a very natural need, personal need, that we want to be utilized. But how can we handle that in a situation where we are, have a team, and I've seen it a lot of times, People in planning say there's not a lot, uh, not enough work for me, and we pull in another story and another story, and it's not the right thing to do. One containment tactic could be to allow this person to do low priority work, either inside the team or outside the team. This will satisfy the person, and it will reduce the noise that else will be coming. Because if a person talks to his line manager and tells him, I have not enough to work to do, that will cre create ripple effects in the system that are not beneficial for an agile transformation. And with that said, if we do these things, remember that we work in a system. So all these four smells, they are interrelated. If we start working on one of them, let's say for instance, the shadowing part where we shadow a specialist outside our team. We might start over here with a little um, activity, like shadowing. But it will have results in all of the other parts. And what we have to remember is that this is a system. And often, we work in one area until we work in another area. But what we should do is actually see what are the consequences of the changes that we do, because they affect each other all the time. Just imagine what would happen if other teams suddenly start shadowing this specialist. What happens to his utilization? Suddenly he has more time to do really special things, maybe even get to the point where he doesn't have enough work to do with his specialty. And that might actually result in a wish to be become more T-profiled. Or there's another uh, way, if we suddenly have a guy that can do the print job, maybe there are five other teams asking us to do their work. And that's a, an example of where we have to dampen or strengthen some of the, um, the activities we do. So with this, I want to say that remember it's a system. Remember to stay alert of how the system reacts and use it. Don't just jump to the next thing. Um, and all in all, I hope that these uh, three examples maybe can inspire you to not just run away, 
but actually to either try to hack the system or at least contain them if you're focused somewhere else. And all Run. of the you're running. <laughs> yeah. And of course, if we do this, we will help the organization become more effective, have more focus on value. And as they say in the, in the Agile Manifesto, with the overstatement, we would say effectiveness over efficiency. That's the, that's the key takeaway here. And as you might have guessed, I'm not a stranger. It's actually my brother. I think, I think that was the best prepared comment I've ever seen. <laughs> Thanks, Dirk. <laughs> I had a couple of questions. Maybe. Yes, agility is under, a, is under attack from the corporate world. Like, safe. <laughs> what are your thoughts about that? Well, <laughs> you said opinionated. Woo uh, I hate safe. I think it's the worst thing that ever happened. It's neither scaled, it's neither agile, and it's not a framework. Like, discuss with any frame, uh, safe uh, fan, and within 30 seconds, you'll have them look up against the wall, and they go like, ah, but you don't have to use everything. Well, then it's not a freaking framework, is it? It's a toolbox, and that's two different things. It's not agile because it has like 19 roles in there and there's nothing like remotely smelling of agility in it and it doesn't scale. It really doesn't. So yeah, that was the opinionated part about uh, SAFE. I think actually it has done a huge disservice and it set the agile movement, if I call it a movement, like 10 years if at least back. Because there's like I said earlier in the talk, like people like recipes, so thanks for this question. Uh, and I agree, it's under attack. Um, there's like people love recipes, right? Especially if they don't understand. If I can't cook, I can't bake, I love a recipe that tells me exactly what to do. And if I execute on that recipe exactly as it says, and I put the oven to that and I to, to, to that temperature and I put the cake in and I've put all the eggs in everything, actually I'll have perfect chocolate chip cookies. Is there eggs in chocolate chip cookies? I don't know. But I get the perfect chocolate chip cookies out, right? If I just follow that recipe. And that's what people think they get with uh, taking a framework like that, like safe, because it's a recipe. The problem is like baking is much more a complicated undertaking while changing your organization and developing software or products in general is a complex undertaking. And complex requires inspect and adapt. And like having 10 weeks before, you know, and as I know the arguments are like, you can even do it within the, uh, your, your um, program increment, et cetera, right? But it's not really inspect and adapt. And we just like, uh, when I go out and talk to organizations, like the first thing they do, they want to have a role mapping. So what does, does the project manager do? What does the business analyst do? What does the so and so and so and so? Like what does the line uh, manager, the functional manager do? And like where do they go? And of course they like it if I give them a mapping and say like whoop, this becomes like project manager, becomes product owner, the team lead becomes the scrum master, the functional manager becomes the chapter lead or whatever. Oh yeah, we'll put Spotify in as well. That gets really good. Like that's, that's a perfect combination. If you just call your team squads, you're saved. It's perfect. That's why I like uh, Scrum at scale, and it's not only because I'm a trainer, it's actually more the other way around that I like it, because Scrum at scale is not a scaling framework, it's not a recipe, it's actually a question asking framework. It has like 12 modules or 12 focal points where it asks you to ask yourself the question, like how are we doing in like a strategic vision? Do we have one, do people know how to navigate this system according to a vision? Like how do we do with cross-team for coordination? And it's like asking those kind of questions. I think that deserves much more uh, to be called a framework. So yeah, I agree it's under attack. And like I said, I think it has set us 10 years back. I've tried to fight it for uh, a long time. Um, totally unsuccessful. I, I'm, I'm actually a little bit puzzled. I don't know what to do with it, to be honest. If anybody has a recipe, let me know. This do you have any opinions on SAFE? I've just seen a lot of um, poor executions. Yeah. 
So, so in theory, so it could be not that bad. Exactly. That's true. And, but what we're always talking about theory, and I haven't seen it really yeah. excel. So. Yeah. So this magic word management, what is that really? So I think management comes from manus, which is Latin, which means hand. So it's like put your hand on something, like, like use your hands. And it automatically directs me to like micromanagement, like telling people how to do stuff. Okay, so that's, and again, it's opinionated. But it's, it's like that's how I see management. And then I think we should use another word, which is leadership. Generally, today, you will see in most organizations, they've started to rename management to leadership, which, again, is super sad because I think it's two different things. To me, leadership, and it's not, I, I also don't dislike, like, on LinkedIn, like, you, you see reshare these, like, uh, a leader, and then you see, like, a boss is like this, uh, is like playing, uh, playing golf with his employees, and, and uh, a leader is, like, showing the way. That insinuates that the leader still knows best if he's showing the way, and I think that's wrong in itself as well, because a leader in, in, in a complex undertaking doesn't know better. Actually, he probably knows the least about the problem, which is one of the reasons that we want to have autonomous teams, the teams that make, a deci take, take deci take, make decisions, um, and not that the team delivers all the information to a leader, so he finally comes up to the same level of information and then can make a decision. right? We want leaders instead of, and that's what this uh, project uh, manager should have, have asked, instead of like, do you all have enough to do? It's like, what can I do to remove uh, impediments, like stuff that makes you slow? I had, there was a, a, um, a, a kind of a town hall meeting in, uh, in Zurich uh, a few years back. I wasn't there, but my wife was there. I think that qualifies enough. That's close enough. And actually, another friend was also there. So they told me about this. And it was at Credit Suisse. Like, this is at this end of the scale of, like, corporate over here. That's the second biggest bank in Switzerland. Super corrupt. Uh, like, bonuses on end. Like, sorry, software developers make a decent salary, but not a lot. But as soon as you get into higher management, like, I mean, you get, like, yeah, it's just crazy. And then they had a speaker from Google. And I'm not saying Google is at the very other end of the scale, but for Zurich, it is pretty much at the other end of the scale. And you're standing on the scene, and you're saying, like, I'm the head of a department of 40 people. That doesn't mean I have 40 people working for me. And I'm sure he had a break there and enjoyed how all these Credit Suisse managers looked at each other and like, what? What else does it mean? And how did he finish? That means I work for 40 people. So it's another like triangle hierarchy that we're putting upside down. And I th to me, that's the definition of, uh, it's not a definition, but it's a super example of what leadership really means. As a leader, you're not there to show them the way because you know better. You're certainly not there to micromanage because then you're a manager, but you're there to help the team. Like you're there to, together with the team, figure out, or the teams, if it's at a higher level, right, to figure out like what's our goal, then give them some guidelines on what's allowed and what's not allowed. Like for instance, we don't cheat and we don't do illegal things, for instance, right? But like what, what, is, uh, what are the guardrails? And then guys go. And whenever you have something in your way that's not working, like, and you think I can help, come to me. That's what leadership is. So I think that's management versus leadership. I hope that answered the question. Thank you. Big applause and lunchtime. Thank you.